All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, first and most importantly, of course, our thoughts and prayers continue to be with the families of the victim of this horrific mass shooting uh, that we occurred in Brooklyn. I want to thank everyone who is joining us this, this morning, this afternoon. We are incredibly lucky to be joined by the team from MedStar uh, Health Harbor Hospital and Shock Trauma, who will talk through the work that their teams have been doing, that fantastic work over the past few days, taking care of those who were victimized in this mass shooting. I also want to extend a quick uh, thanks of all the hospital team who've been treating patients as a result of this event. In addition to Harbor and Shock Trauma, University of Maryland's uh, University's ER, Baltimore Washington Medical C Center, uh, Union Memorial Hospital, Johns Hopkins, and a number of local clinics who filled it walk-ins. And in addition to uh, the updates uh, provided by BPD. I'm also going to be addressing our mobilization of city agencies to respond to not only this this mass shooting and uh, across the city as we move into the 4th of July. I also want to thank our council partners who are with us today, uh, Council Vice President Middleton, Councilwoman Porter, Councilwoman Ramos, and Councilman Conway, the chair of the Public Safety uh, Committee, who are all with us. We are doing everything in our power to ensure uh, that the horrific violence that occurred this weekend is not repeated either in Brooklyn or any other neighborhood across Baltimore. In a moment, Monsi will discuss the resources they stood up uh, and what, what, what that work will look like across Baltimore City. Across the rest of city government, Every single agency that provides resident services of any kind is mobilizing for Brooklyn and in neighborhoods across the city. This includes both uh, the Housing Authority and uh, our Department of Housing and Community Development, Public Works, DLT, the Enoch Pratt Free Library, Reckon Parks, and Baltimore City Public Schools. And as we hit in tonight and tomorrow of uh, the 4th of July, we know uh, that people will continue to gather with their loved ones to celebrate. We want people to gather and celebrate at the Inner Harbor, at Cherry Hill, where they have their festival as they do every year. We want people to do that. But I implore everyone uh, to please be safe. Think of those around you and the lives you could potentially impact if you make a wrong choice. We are gearing up every uh, resource at our disposal from BPD, Monsey, the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods, and all of our community engagement partners as we work to ensure that we have a safe 4th of July as always we want here in Baltimore. I want to thank all of Baltimore's community for the love and support we've shown to our neighbors in this most difficult time. And before I wrap up, I want to reiterate what I said yesterday once again. We won't stop until we find those responsible and hold them accountable. We won't. With that said, we need the help of our residents and anyone that knows anything to come forward and say something so that we can bring uh, those who are recklessly carrying out acts of violence like this to justice. We will continue to wrap our arms around uh, Brooklyn and the entire community as we continue uh, to hold those accountable who choose to carry illegal guns and use them in the commitments of crimes in Baltimore like this tragic incident that we saw. Again, uh, thank you to all of our partners who are here with us today. Thank you to everyone that has been working in the Brooklyn community and from those around the country who have offered their support, their resources, their love, everything that they could offer to the city of Baltimore at this most trying time. I'll now turn it over to Interim Monsi Director uh, Stephanie uh, Mavronis to quickly talk through the updates that her and her team are leading. Madam Director. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Mavronis, I'm serving as Interim Director of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. I want to first take a moment to acknowledge the weight and pain um, that we're all feeling in this moment. The loss of our South Baltimore neighbors is not easy. Um, we know that their families and the community and all of us in this time um, will face the trauma associated with this event, um, these losses, these injuries for years to come. 
The trauma associated with what our residents experienced yesterday is why we're bringing together a host of resources and partners to provide services from mental health counseling supports to employment assistance and conflict mediation in real time. Um, as of yesterday at 12 noon, Monty has been on the ground as part of a full coordinated neighborhood stabilization response, or CNSR, pulling together resources which include the following, mental health counseling with partners from Baltimore Crisis Response Incorporated, Catholic Charities, Red Cross of Central Maryland, and Transformation Health. We also have Baltimore City Public School social workers familiar with the immediate community on site, housing services with partners from the Baltimore City Department of Housing and Community Development and the Housing Authority, health services with partners from MedStar Harbor Hospital and Healthcare Access Maryland, child care and educational services with the Maryland State Department of Education, SNAP assistance with the Department of Human Services, conflict mediation with our partners from Safe Streets Brooklyn, rental and utility assistance with partners from the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success, Southern Cap Center, employment assistance with partners from the Mayor's Office of Employment Development and the South Baltimore Employment Connection Center. Um, also assistance with on obtaining vital records with partners from the Franciscan Center and wraparound supports with the Enoch Pratt Free Library, Brooklyn Branch, Moms Demand Action and Living Classrooms Foundation. We also have Monty's Victim Services Team, BPD's Victim Services Team, and the Victim and Witness Division of the State's Attorney's Office on hand to support the community where it will remain on site all week at the Brooklyn Homes Community Center through this Saturday. As part of our 45-day coordinated neighborhood stabilization response that Mayor Scott activated yesterday morning, Monty has also deployed Baltimore's Peace Mobile um, to act as a resource hub in a space of solace for residents at this time. We know that incidents of violence have any number of personal, mental, and or emotional impacts. So South Baltimore neighbors, please know that our team is here to support and facilitate your healing and well-being at this time. You can always reach a member of the Monty team by calling 410-929-5488 or by emailing monty.victimsupport at baltimorecity.gov. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again in the midst of this senseless and hor horrific tragedy. Gun violence touches and affects all of us doing uh, all of us and is doing a great harm to our cities across the country. We're standing here to together in support of our people of Baltimore, the citizens of South Baltimore and the victims and citizens of Brooklyn who had to experience this uh, tragedy on such a, a small scale right in their own neighborhoods. Our hearts and prayers continue to go out with these families and acquaintances, friends, and co-workers, um, and our city as well as our community. I would be remiss if I did not offer sincere gratitude to all the area hospitals, medics, agencies who contributed their time and energy in responding to such a large-scale event. Thank you to all these partners for handling such a chaotic situation in such a professional manner to the point that we saved probably countless lives who were uh, critical at the time. Your work is truly life-saving and impactful. The emergency response and cooperation provided by all city agencies as well as federal partners, elected officials, and members of the community show that we are truly committed to working together. These partnerships will and must lead to progress. We are committed to doing a thorough investigation and identifying and apprehending and prosecuting these individuals hold, held responsible for this uh, chaotic incident and this horrific amount of violence. To that point, we'll, we, we, you will see we have a Metro Crime Stoppers flyers here, and I'm pleased to announce that the reward is up to $28,000, thanks in part to our federal partners. I strongly urge anyone with any information to help us bring these individuals to justice. If you have any information, please call 911 or 1-866-7-LOCKUP. In the coming days, weeks, and months, we will strive to move forward and we will reassess and take lessons learned from this incident. We've already started our after action for what we could have done better, um, what we could, have, could improve on as we move so we do not have another incident like this ever. Most importantly, let's not forget that we are talking about human lives. The effects that gun violence has on our community and trauma experienced by all friends, loved ones, and neighbors. We have identified the two individuals, two fatal victims from the mass shootings as 18-year-old Aliyah Gonzalez and 20-year-old Kylas Fabemi. 
The other victims include 13, 15 victims between the ages of 13 and 17, 13 victims between the ages of 18 and 32. Thank you and please keep all the affected in this tragedy in your thoughts. At this time, I'll turn it back to Mayor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, next, we will hear from our, our partners that we are very grateful for from both uh, Harbor Hospital and then Shock Trauma. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Habib. I'm the Associate Chair of the Emergency Department at MedStar Harbor Hospital. I want to thank you, Mayor Scott, for acknowledging the work in healthcare by holding this event. I'm an emergency department physician, and I can say on behalf of all emergency department clinicians that we trained in this specialty to help the community that we serve. We're always prepared to treat a variety of ailments, often ones that are life-altering and life-saving. Harbor Hospital is a small community hospital that's at the center of these neighborhoods, Cherry Hill, Brooklyn. We work here daily because we care. Medical care is something that we do every day and often without recognition, but what happened in the early hours of Sunday morning was outside of our norm. Our emergency department team went to work that night anticipating a routine overnight shift when they were unexpectedly faced with the arrival of several patients, many minors, with traumatic gunshot wounds, the majority of whom were brought in by private vehicle accompanied by family and loved ones who were appropriately concerned. Within an hour, 19 patients from our community, 14 of whom were teenagers, nine of which were minors, and many of whom were critically ill, were brought to Harbor Hospital's emergency department. We didn't know if we were safe. We didn't know if the shooter or shooters were right outside of our hospital doors. We approached what could have been an overwhelmingly chaotic and terrifying situation with calmness, bravery, and a systematic approach with a key tool being teamwork. Our emergency response plan was activated and the hospital went on immediate lockdown to secure the campus and ensure the safety of all the patients and the associates. Doctors, nurses, PAs, techs, residents, and intensivists, hospitalists, we all came together from home, from other departments in the hospital, just to be in one location and to help um, the community and help patients who weren't just victims, but our sisters and daughters and sons and brothers in our community. Baltimore City Emergency Medical Services, MedStar Transport crews, and our tertiary care center crews were ready to provide immediate transport support. We performed rapid triages on more than a dozen high acuity patients within minutes, and we prioritized patients based on individual assessments, several of whom were critically unstable. We maximized our resources available to us overnight at a small community hospital, and we performed life-saving procedures to stabilize patients while partnering with our tertiary care center colleagues who supported us maximally during this challenging crisis. Ten patients were transferred to Baltimore Trauma Centers. We at MedStar Harbor Hospital are dedicated to providing quality care to our community, and while we are not de a designated trauma center, we have experience responding to victims of violence in our community. Our extraordinary team recognized this as a mass shooting event, and we mobilized our resources within minutes. We thank our dedicated and invaluable team for showing up every day and for being prepared to give it your all when it comes to taking care of our patients. Our prayers are with the community in South Baltimore during this troubling time. Thank you for your time. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I bring you regards from the 500 people that are the Arch Adams College Shock Trauma Center. You know, we drill for these disasters, but um, we're never really sure how it's gonna work when it actually happens. You know, we haven't been tested like this since 2015 in the aftermath of the Freddie Gray death. And um, I'm really happy to be able to tell you that it worked about as close to perfectly, I think, as it possibly could have. The thing that saves people's lives during mass casualties is organization. And this was as organized a response as I have ever seen. You heard about the wonderful job that the guys at Harbor Hospital did. Baltimore City EMS was spectacular and their chief, Ben Lawner, was over there helping sort patients, go here, go there. We suspended the need for consultation. 
We said, just come. It's okay. The answer is yes. Don't waste time calling. And we got report from the pre-hospital guys on the way in. We uh, opened up all of our resources. You know, it's, it's important to realize that the ED at Harbor wasn't empty. And our TRU was far from empty on Saturday night at one o'clock. So this gets fitted on top of the everyday busy weekend business. And utilizing the adult ED and the PGD, we put one of my faculty members, Rich Whitmire, down in the ambulance bay and he was air traffic control. He says, you go here, you go there. We communicated the ones that came upstairs I was air traffic control for. In the middle of all this, we did two major um, operative procedures to save people's lives. And, and so the most impressive thing was in the middle of all this, as we, we were getting the last couple of people in, I grabbed one of my partners and said, what do you hear? And he looked around, he said, nothing. I said, that's exactly correct. Nobody's yelling, nobody's speaking loudly, we're just doing our job. And we are so pleased that we were able to be part of what was such a superb disaster response. Um, you have all heard me say it's not if, it's only when. Well, when arrived on, on Saturday night and when will arrive again and all of us, the entire medical community in the city of Baltimore, will come together whenever that happens, and I hope we'll be able to have as good an outcome. It wasn't perfect. We wished everybody had lived, but a, a bunch of people lived that maybe weren't going to live. Thank you, uh, Dr. Scalia, and thank you to you and all the medical professionals, and of course, our fire EMS who do this work every day, but in particular for this day. Uh, and with that, we will take a few questions. So we'll take all of our questions here from this mic. We are going to prioritize our local media first. So that would be WBAL, WMAR, WBFF, Baltimore Sun, The Banner. So all of our local media first. Please say your name and what affiliate you are with when you are asking your question. Additionally, the Metro Crime Stopper Flyer will be available electronically. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, David Collins, WBAL-TV. You're good, Dave. Oh, this. Uh, I have a multi-part question, but it, you're going to be able to answer this, I hope, very easily. Do you have a suspect's description? Can you say at this point what type of weapons were used? Was this a targeted or indiscriminate type of event? And social media is showing a young man pulling out a semi-automatic weapon from a backpack. Um, what do you make of all that? Again, any, anyone, that young man is a suspect in the, ish, in the crime because he had a weapon at the scene. Anyone who had a weapon at the scene is one of our, will be one of our suspects until we eliminate that they are not. So we want to speak to them. Um, we will be putting different things out through our PIO to help us identify individuals that we need to speak to. Right now, our detectives are still working through interviewing every one of the victims. Um, we will continue to pursue um, any leads, so that's why we need the help from the community because we have only touched some of the video that's out there. Everyone had, a, had their cameras working, had their phones working, and there's much more video out there that we have to look at. Um, at this point, we do know there were multiple weapons and multiple casings that were recovered. We won't go into what exactly was recovered, but we do know that there were multiple in both incidences. And Dave, just to your point again, as I, I said yesterday about the young man with the video, right? I think that is also something that we have to highlight again, as I said yesterday. There were grown adults filming young people with guns who said nothing, who did nothing, who didn't say to the police, hey, I know this teenager's out here at this event with a gun. And we have to have a sense of responsibility to our own community as well, because there was a time when even those who were the, the toughest of the tough in the street, if they saw some young kid with something like that, they would step in there, do something. We can't deteriorate our, ourselves until we think it's cool just to film a young kid on Instagram with a weapon and post that to get likes. That means that your, your self-characterization 
of yourself as a man is a falsehood if you do that. This is for Acting Commissioner Worley, Phil Yakubuski from WBAL here in Baltimore uh, News Radio. Just asking about the, uh, you know, we hear a lot about the stop snitching culture in the city. Are the victims being cooperative in this case? We also heard yesterday that this was an unsanctioned event. What are you folks doing, and this is for the mayor too as well, to make sure that something like that doesn't happen in the next couple of days? There were 600 people in the after action report. Is that being looked at as far as how many people can gather in an event like this? Yes, th this was an unpermitted event. Our men and women deal with unpermitted events every single day. Since COVID, we have people who think they can just have parties without permits, large gatherings. Our men and women deal with that every single day. The day before this, we had a, 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 a pop-up event that we had to issue a cease and desist order that we did, and that event went away. So a lot of the events that we deal with, you don't even hear about because our men and women do a great job of taking care of it. So this event did come up. It was... I don't want to say it wasn't advertised like normal, but we did not find it like we normally do. Um, that's why we didn't have the robust deployment that we had last year. Last year, we found out about it three days ahead of time, and we were able to put together an ops plan. This year, we did not find out about it at all until the day of. Cooperation from the victims? We are still investigating. Most of them, as you know, are under the age of 18, so we have to get approval from the parent or, or have a lawyer present. Uh, present. We do have all the other victims that we're trying to talk to. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been released from the hospital, so now we have to try to find them in their homes and their neighborhoods. I'm Darcy Costello from the Baltimore Sun. I think this question is for BPD, but it might be Monsi also. Um, at what point did police or other officials realize this gathering was really large? Did you have concerns that it could take a bad turn? And if so, what was the strategy to prevent danger? Yeah, we're still looking into that. The, the, we did eventually figure out that they were having Brooklyn Day, which is what this event, event is called. We're looking at to, as to why it wasn't escalated up higher to the, the appropriate commanders that were working at a quicker pace so that we could get resources there. And that's, a, that's an investigation. That's part of our after action plan to see um, if we could have done anything better and if we could have to make sure we fix it and it, we don't have another incident like this again. Do you have an estimate of how large the gathering was? We, we know it was at least a couple hundred people. Mackenzie Frost from Fox 45. So going off of that, looking at when BPD knew about this event, can you give us a time frame as to when you did find out about it, or do you have any indication as to when the department found out? Yeah, it, it's the same. We, we are looking into that to find out when we found out. It was but no several hours before the shooting. I can tell you that. And then we also know that there were Safe Streets workers at this event. Maybe this is a question for the interim Monzi director. If Safe Streets workers are at an event, the first question is, was this put on by Safe Streets? And then also, if they were there and they knew that this was happening, many people had weapons there, was it on Safe Streets to call the police department to let them know that there was a threat? or a potential threat. Thanks for that question. Um, we do know that this event fell within Safe Street's catchment zone. Um, Brooklyn Homes is a part of that catchment zone. This was not a Safe Street sponsored event. Um, I do have information that earlier in the evening, some of our Safe Street staff, just as a part of their community activities, were out there and actively de-escalated de three to four conflicts earlier in the evening, um, but they were not there at the time that this incident occurred. Is it part of the Safe Street's protocol to relay that information to BPD if there is a potential threat? threat that's possible at a large gathering like this? I don't know um, that Safe Streets would relay that. I would say there is some level of communication about any incidents that are outside of their purview. But again, the time at which Safe Streets was at this event, there was not an indication that, that this is where the event was heading. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Janine Donaldson with WBAL. Wanted to just recap um, what hospitals were uh, involved in the response. I know it was a harbor and then people were transported to other ones as well, Union and Johns, but I just wanted to recap those. And then also the age ranges of all the victims. Yeah, the age ranges go from 13 to 32. Um, I know we used Union. Uh, good afternoon, Dante Stewart, uh, Acting Fire Chief. So the hospitals that were involved was Harbor Hospital, 
Baltimore, Washington Medical Center received two patients that uh, drove themselves there and also Union Memorial Hospital. Of uh, the 16, approximately 16 that went to Harbor Hospital, we transported six to six um, shock trauma. And then it was just the ages? Uh, the how ages many? were ranged from 13 to 34. Okay, do you know how many were um, in the uh, Pete's category? There were 15 between the ages of 13 and 17, and the rest of them were, the other 15 were between, above 17. Thanks, guys. Scott McFarland with CBS. A pair of questions for the Acting Commissioner. First of all, are you concerned about retaliation and this triggering a cycle of gun violence? Yes, we, we, we are concerned. We're, we're always concerned about retaliation in every single incident. We have a crime meeting that's going on right now while we're having the press conference where all our commanders are talking about what happened between um, over the weekend and what happened between Monday and Wednesday. So we, we have all those things in place. We talk about it. We have a criminal intel. We do multiple meetings to share information where we think retaliation is coming. And we also have the 4th of July weekend that we're working, working with to make sure we keep everybody safe and the fireworks go off without any incidents. You'd also mentioned ballistics indicated there were multiple firearms used. So does multiple mean more than two? Yes. Is it possible it's more than three? I mean, I'm trying to get a sense of just how many firearms might have been discharged. It, we are still looking at every casing because what happens, you have, we have multiple casings, for example, we have multiple casings from one um, caliber of weapon, but that doesn't mean every one came from that same weapon. We have to look, um, basically go down, have the uh, crime lab decipher whether these casings came from this weapon, those casings came from another weapon. But we do there, know there are more than two or three. Thank you both. Yes, sir. Hi, George Solis, NBC News. Question for you, Commissioner. It is our understanding that this is an annual event that takes place in the Brooklyn neighborhood. You're making it sound as if this was something that took place last year and that you didn't have the awareness. Was staffing of police also at play here, why there may not have been adequate protection at this event? No, staffing was not an issue. We had multiple officers deployed other locations in the city that we could have moved there. What happened last year is lots of times this event is posted on social media that we're able to find. We did not find it this year. Last year we found out a couple days ahead of time uh, and it was not the same date. It's the different week, different Saturday every year. So this last year was the end of June. We knew it was coming up at some point, but we had no indication that it was happening that day because we had never seen any advertisements for it. And no one had notified, as far as I know, no one notified in BPD that Brooklyn Day was happening on July 1st. This question might be for you, Mr. Mayor. From the victims, the two that passed during this mass shooting incident, have you had an opportunity to speak with their families? What have they told you? How are they feeling? What is your sentiment and message to them? Yeah, we'll, we'll be going through the protocol following with, with BPD as, they, as we always do when an incident like this and go through every single, every single victim and family after we've made the appropriate contacts, after they've done the conversations that they have to have before I can even have that. But we will be talking to every single one. This is something, unfortunately, that I do consistently uh, in our city. Thank you. Good afternoon. Dylan Siegelbaum, The Baltimore Banner. I know there's been discussion about uh, this year's Brooklyn Day being unpermitted. Has the event ever been permitted in the past, and what difference would that make, if any, in terms of requirements for security or police? Well, if it, in the past, I don't believe it was ever permitted. I don't think a permit was ever applied for. If we know that, like, for example, we know is what, what is happening on July 4th. So we have events. Every event that we have permitted, we, have, we can have an operations plan for it if we expect something to happen. Um, so if we would have known even three or four days ahead of time, last year we put a complete operations plan together with multiple officers stationed throughout, as well as all our other city agencies were there last year to help us. Not only it's not just a police issue, we have all our other city agencies there to help us. And we could have had that this year had we had more advance notice than figuring out the day of the event. And just to add for clarification for everyone, Brooklyn Day is something that happens 
every year for the last 27 years. It doesn't happen on the same day, so it's not like the 4th of July when it's going to be this day every year. It's a, a moving event, so to speak, but it's something that the community has had every every year. But when things are notified, then other things are, are put in place at a, at a much rapid pace. Was there any, um, I know you said um, only found out about it, if I heard correctly, earlier in the earlier in the day, Sunday. Um, I guess just to, if it's an annual event that happens every year, was there an effort made to try to find out what weekend it was happening, if there, was, if there wasn't a permit? Say, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your, I couldn't hear your question. Um, You're really low. Was there, was there an effort to try to find out what weekend it, it was happening in advance? Yes, our, our, we have an intel officer that's in the, in the Southern District, is one of the best intel officers in the agency. He was proactively looking to see, along with our analysts in our open source unit, to see if we could find anything on any of the social media sites that said what day it was occurring, so we could have planned. So any advance notice we could have got ahead of that finding out during the event. Could have, allowed, could have allowed us to put other city resources as well as police there to try not to, we, we wouldn't necessarily been able to stop it, but we could have been there as a presence to deter any wrong, wrong uh, any you. issues. Hi, my first question is uh, for the hospital. Um, are all of the victims stabilized? Can you talk about uh, those conditions? We have uh, seven people that are still inpatient. Four of them remain in critical condition. The other three are stable. Thank you. And my next question is for Mayor Scott and Armanzi. Um, unfortunately, or uh, obviously all violence is awful, but we have a lot of kids and teenagers that were injured in this. Um, do we know if they were in violation of curfew? Do you see this as some type of condemnation on the curfew policy? Can you talk about that a little bit? No. And I think that we, we, when you think about this event, right, you have to think about a few things. You've heard uh, multiple people say, you heard members in the community say that this is a multi-generational event, right? Uh, so if I'm a the way that curfew works, especially for those who are not from Baltimore, one, like this is Brooklyn Day. If I live in Brooklyn homes, I can be outside of my house, right? So we have to understand that. The second part, even if I am not from Brooklyn homes, if I'm with an adult, then I'm not in violation of the curfew. And just to talk to you in a practical example of what has happened in Baltimore for the eternity of Baltimore having uh, a curfew. If I am a, in the old days, a police officer walks up to a group of kids in an event like this and an adult says, hey, they're with me, then that means it's over. There's nothing else. And the same exists today, whether it be Monsi or other partners out there. We have to remember again that there were hundreds of adults and hundreds of children who were out there as well all together in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Gloria Pasmino, CNN. Uh, for both you, Commissioner, and for the mayor, I know you've talked about this. It sounds like you are citing the lack of awareness that this party was taking place for the lack of police presence. People who we spoke to in the neighborhood told us that in previous years, police was always present. And I believe it was Councilwoman Porter who told the son that there had been a breakdown in communication and that she felt that the community was being neglected. So I wonder if you could just respond to that specific criticism. And if this is an event that's happened before that's been staffed by police, why was there not a more speedy reaction here? It, it is an event that's happened, like the mayor said, every single year. And most of the time, we are able to find out the date that's occurring. That's why you have police present. Police presence on this date, we did not, as far as long, far as we know, and we are definitely looking into this to see if anyone knew ahead of time that Brooklyn Day was occurring on July the first. I can tell you, all of our social media um, analysts, our intel officers from the Southern, and any none of the officers that I, we spoke to 
ever escalate anything that Brooklyn Day was having happening that day. We knew it was coming. We just didn't know when. But we could have planned for it and put a plan into effect, something like last year, had we known it was occurring on Saturday. And, and I'll just add uh, on in a different way, is that what we can't lose focus of is that we are talking about a few people. This is who we should be focused on. A few people who cowardly decided to shoot up a big block party celebration for a community. That's where our focus should be, on them, the weapons they use, where they got those weapons from, how they got them in their hands, and how we're going to hold all of them accountable. Yes, we want people, when folks have events, we want them to have permits. We want to do that so that everything can be in decency and order, as we say. But we cannot allow those details to outweigh the fact that we have people who recklessly were shooting into crowds of 100 people who were peacefully celebrating in their neighborhood. Uh, and if I may, just to follow up. Earlier today, but it sounds like Baltimore's made a great amount of pro progress in recent years when it comes to gun violence. And for people who may be watching this across the country and maybe saying to themselves, "Well, this is what happens in Baltimore. What's their message to them? Uh, and what do you want them to know about the, pro the progress that the city has actually made in recent years?" Well, listen. As I said yesterday, and I said to to your folks earlier on your on the morning show. We have made progress, even with this incident, right? We have a 20% reduction in homicides in Baltimore, right? You guys cover it all the time where cities are having the, the direct opposite across this country. We still have a reduction in non-fatal shootings, even with 30 people being shot in one day in Baltimore, 28 non-fatal shooting victims. But these kind of violent incidents happen in Baltimore. This is not just a Baltimore thing. We have to be honest. This is the United States of America. This is our longest standing public health challenge. And we need to focus on gun violence, regardless of where it happens, right? Whether it's in inner city Baltimore, whether it's in suburbia, whether it's in rural America, with the same vigor that we focus on another epidemic that we had a few years ago, a pandemic in COVID-19. Uh, we are talking about now having over 300 mass shootings in this country where we pride ourselves on being the leaders of the free world, but we cannot seem to get to a point where we're going to have uh, the lives of American citizens mean more than American citizens' ability to have guns. We're going to continue to make that progress, not just with BPD and them going out and seizing already 1,300 weapons uh, this year, most of which we know come from other places, some which are ghost guns that are bought online and anybody can buy, which I'm going to say again, that if we want to truly talk about dealing with guns and gun violence in this country, we have to take this conversation beyond not just me, but all my brother and sister mayors around the country who we have these conversations consistently. It's like we take turns telling each other that we're here to support each other and we know that we're going through. Not just about governors around the country and state legislators who are busting their bus to do things, right? Because one of the reasons why our weapons come from other places is because Maryland has some of the strongest gun laws in the country. We need not our Maryland fabulous federal delegation, not our wonderful president and his administration. We need those members in Congress who said way back when, when Columbine happened in 1999, when I was a freshman in high school, they wouldn't have one more because they were going to do something to actually do something. How about we ban ghost guns in this country right now? How about we force uh, gun companies to have smart technology on their guns by a certain period, the same way that we're doing with electric vehicles and how we're dealing with the environment? When are we going to have that conversation? In addition to all the things that we need around mental health, behavioral health, trauma, all of that, but you're talking about a country where it's easier for a 14-year-old kid to order pieces together to put a gun together and go out and use it in commitments of a crime than it is for me to get cleared in D from CVS. That's what we should be talking about every day in this country until those folks take action. Because I could stand up here and, and talk about uh, back and forth stuff that they like to do with 
uh, partisan politics and say, you hear folks say, well, oh, the violence has happened in Democrat-led cities. Well, the guns are coming from Republican-led states, right? But who cares? People are dying in Baltimore, in the United States, and that's what should matter, and that's what we should be acting on every day. Thank you, Mr. Major Javier Vega, Telemundo. I just want to get the full picture about the wounded. It was just informed four of them are in a critical situation. So that means from the total, how much, how many of them are in the hospital and how many of them are back home? So there's seven remaining in the hospital, four of them in critical condition. All the others have been released. And then, of course, we have the two that were deceased. Okay, thank you. Just a quick follow-up to what we've heard throughout the day. If BPD didn't know about this, but Safe Streets did, is that a breakdown in communication within the mayor's office and city government? Again, Mackenzie, I'll just say this. Uh, we know that, that folks want to make narratives about this situation. The reality is, is that this is an action of a few who decided to shoot people. Safe Streets was not there, as you heard, when it happened. We know how Safe Streets works, right? We understand the work that they do. We know that in order for them to be credible, they have to be able to carry that credible message in the community. We are going to investigate every breakdown that you heard before, but what we're not going to do is stand up here and try to make this about uh, uh, some organization decisions or what they did or what they didn't do today. We're going to go through it all and talk about what actually happened. But most importantly, for you in the, in the law and order station, it should be about those people who pulled the trigger and helping us find them, blasting those pictures out there to hold those people accountable who ruined Brooklyn Day, who took two lives and who injured 28 others. Hi, this is just a follow-up on um, Acting Commissioner Worley's statement that there was an option to deploy more resources, like there were other resources available. We've heard that a helicopter flew over at like 11 or earlier and saw a crowd of hundreds. So were there conversations to deploy more resources? And when and what were they? Obviously, the, the conversation to deploy more resources was too late. By the time we got there, the, the, event, the incident already occurred. Um, what happens, we have officers on the ground and in the districts who get information, ask for Foxtrot. It was relayed to the, the members on the ground that were monitoring the party. Um, and then what we want to do is look into what they did with the information and how quickly it was escalated up so that we could get them extra resources. Because one district, the, the party of that size, a district cannot handle that themselves. There has to be multiple resources come from not only police department, we could have asked for city resources to come, which we had some working in other parts of the city that we could have quickly moved there, but unfortunately we didn't get there in time to prevent what happened. Thank you for one last question. What are you doing to make the Baltimore safe for the 4th, and what will visitors see and not see in terms of security at the Inner Harbor? You will see what we've done in the past, as many years have we've dealt with, we've had 4th of July. It's a celebration that we want everyone to come to the harbor and enjoy. You will see multiple officers deployed through several zones around the harbor, as well as officers in the districts working to patrol and keep all those communities safe and anything that may pop up on the 4th of July during the day or at nighttime, either permitted or unpermitted. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.